we're going to begin with a conversation together, but very quickly invite others uh, onto that conversation. But let me first begin by introducing myself. I'm Al Roxburgh, uh, part of the managing team of the journal, and I live in Vancouver, Canada. And uh, Martin, you're a member of the management team. Why don't you introduce yourself? Yes, uh, I'm also uh, the CEO of for Mission, which is a mission organization that mainly manifests itself as a college. So we're also for Mission College, and we train uh, a wide range of people uh, for mission and ministry, primarily in a UK context. So going on from there to introduce the other UK participants, yeah. um, Harvey, uh, Giovanni, uh, I never can say your name properly, Harvey, your surname. <laughs> We've been friends for 10 years, Martin. I know, I know I'm, I'm trying and failing miserably. Quiani, is that reason? Okay. So Harvey, uh, I first knew when he was uh, an MA student, but he's since gone on to much greater things and is currently on staff uh, at Hope, Liverpool Hope University. Uh, he's in the chair that was previously occupied by Andrew Walls, who some of you remember as a, a significant missiologist. So, Harvey is following in his footsteps, which is great. Um, and then Tim Reith, uh, who uh, you may be able to hear at some point but not see. Um, Tim is on staff at Fortune. He's also a minister in the Reform Church, um, and uh, he's one of our regional directors responsible for a number of our campuses, uh, does many other things as well. And then Paul Weston is on staff at Ridley. Ridley College is an Anglican uh, institution in Cambridge, which is within broadly evangelical of the church, I think it's fair to say. And, to say. Um, and then we have um, Sally, Sally, who is uh, a Baptist minister. I think uh, that's fair, isn't it? You, I know you're married to a Baptist minister, but aren't you also a Baptist minister in right, well, Sally? I'm accredited to myself, yeah. I have a... I thought so. <laughs> Did it surprise you, Martin? No, 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 no. no. I was just checking because yeah. um, you're an enigma in the same ways, uh, all of which are <laughs> helpful. Uh, but Sally's kind of on the front line in a very interesting church in London, but she also has uh, her PhD in the world of psychology. Sociology. Well, philosophy, really, the PhD is in philosophy. Yeah. 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 Okay. So um, that's an interesting mix. Uh, so she's very much on the frontier of mission, and we've been delighted that she's also, well, actually, all of the people who've been are part of the um, editorial team in one way or another. So, yeah, that's, I think I haven't missed anybody from the UK, is that right? That's it. I think that's it. And uh, let me introduce uh, Mark Lau Branson, who is a dear friend and colleague, and he teaches at uh, Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, uh, which is on the west coast of uh, North America in California. And um, Mark has been uh, a really part of these conversations for multiple years. So we have, we being uh, those who are participants in the management and editing of the journal, um, wanting to invite this roundtable conversation. And let me frame it a little bit, and then we'll, we'll get this going. Uh, first of all, thank you, all of those who are coming on. Um, you will notice on the Zoom screen, in the bottom, toward the right-hand side, at the bottom, a little bubble called chat. And this is the uh, way in which many of you can begin to participate. And uh, if you open the chat, as some of you already have, um, you're able to uh, type in questions or comments, and we will be paying attention to that so that this dialogue that we're having will not be just 
across the group of us, but we can engage in NDU. So you're invited to do that. Uh, second thing, uh, just background. Um, most of you will be familiar with the journal. In this latest issue of the journal, which we're interacting with today, um, one of the things that we were seeking to do was to ask the question, how do we listen to and engage from a kind of a missional perspective so much of the, the bubbling, the turmoil, the anxiety that's going on in, in North America, in Europe, in many other places, and you could name lots of things uh, around that. Um, how do we address this? And, and part of what we did was to say, what would it be like if we really began to practice what we believe, that, that God is actually in our neighborhoods and communities and is up to stuff? And what would it be like if we began to just listen to the stories of what some of God's people are up to in the midst of a lot of turmoil and confusion going on in, in our world and present those stories and share them? Then the second thing was uh, the group that you see here, we began to talk about how do we theologically engage these stories? And we started to realize that as we were asking that question, that we did not want to become experts looking in, like a, a surgeon opening up a body and investigating. But how do we, and as you've gathered, all of us come from relatively, what, what, what we, in academic and leadership positions, but how do we dwell in these stories? so that they speak to us? And how do we dwell in these stories so that we might hear God in the stories? So that's the context of this round table. And for the next 50 plus minutes, we want to invite conversation and invite you to join us. Um, you are panelists. Anything you want to add to that before we jump in? Well, let's jump in. Uh, if you've seen the journal, you'll see that there are stories from uh, Halifax and Vancouver and Nottingham and Chesterfield in the UK, a group of stories uh, on the ground. And um, so I, I'm going to begin and jump in uh, with the panelists and ask a very general question which is as you've listened to these stories, as you've dwelt in them, what are the ways in which you yourself have experienced yourself being read by the stories? Uh, and if that is too abstract a question, just raise your hand and I'll ask Martin to ask a, a much simpler question. But as you've read it, where do you find yourself stuck or caught um, and, and, and wanting to explore more? So let me just open it up. Uh, I'm not going to pick on anybody, but let's just open it up and invite uh, comments and conversation at this point. And don't forget to unmute. Yeah, I did then. I offered words of amazing wisdom and I've, I didn't unmute myself. Um, <clears throat> I think as somebody who, who um, is, I guess, as self describes as a, an academic practitioner, um, I, I found each of the stories in this particular issue of the journal really exciting. I mean, I found sort of, you know, sort of energy bubbling up within me because it seems to encapsulate, certainly from the British context in which I'm working, uh, some of the really key questions that are facing us in mission. And it seems to me over and over again that these are, these are almost, um, and I use the word primal with a little bit of hesitation, but I think they are primal missional questions in the sense that I think that we have built up a whole superstructure of various questions that we have traditionally brought to bear on the question of mission and many of us have um, talked about them often and written about them but it, it's, it's just a reapprehension of the the vital nature of the questions that are being 
raised in the stories here. So I, that was just a kind of kickoff. I, I think we need, therefore, to be, and I found myself trying to address familiar questions, but in really new kinds of ways and putting connections together between things that we talk about at different levels, but in new ways. And that's, and that for me has been really invigorating and energizing. So I'm, I'm full of praise to God for that. Mm. That's lovely. Well, in contrast to Paul, I would probably describe myself more as a thinking activist. Um, and I found the stories hugely encouraging. I was attempting to let the stories speak for themselves. Um, but the academic in me, I guess, was looking for themes and uh, things that, uh, questions that I've been asking. And I found several of those, and that was very encouraging. I guess uh, how, how it read me was uh, whether I'm truly um, willing to be involved in the kind of messiness that comes through in some of the stories. And um, because I think there's a, a, a cost in these stories that maybe is hinted at, but doesn't always appear. And yet I know that for many of the people kind of joining us from the chat, they're, um, they will be very aware of the cost of trying to practice mission, particularly in a marginalised area. So it was challenging me about, about that. Yeah, that picks up on um, what I was aware of and am aware of in our own church life. Of it really is in what's often thought of as the mundane, the, the daily life. We're in, we're in the middle, we're just three years into a, a, a new church community um, adventure. And as we're sitting back into more of a reflective mode, and that group has expanded, um, in as we look back over the neighborhood we've lived in for over a decade and that we're in, engaged in now in some new practices, um, that as we had prayed for our neighbors, we're just very aware of some ways that neighbor life is inside us and our lives are there. Um, we're, we're in and out of courts trying to successfully or not keep our kids or neighborhood kids out of prison we're um, dealing with all kinds of various arrangements of family life. There's just so many things that are just, it really is the mundane. And because as we're living with and at times able to articulate um, the spirits where God's work among us and the neighbors hear that and then they name it also, the way the conversations are shaped, overlapping normal everyday life, overlapping scripture, overlapping um, as Alan brought out in the in the editorial, the multiple layers of anxiety, um, large and small that we're living with, uh, but the stories in the journal all captured those things, right? That in the midst of anxiety, you have this incredible hope and incredible um, uh, love that takes over a room and changes lives. You have um, churches disturbed by anxiety, as we ought sometimes. Um, so anyway, it was that mix of mundane and wonder, um, normal everyday life, large social factors that was woven through, that were woven through the stories. That's definitely what we experienced. Yeah, for me, it was the sort of a focus on what's happening with God working at the margins of society. So reading through the stories, over and over again, I saw really stories of God doing something among broken people, among, among people with mental health issues in Nottingham, among, among migrants and, and just people at the margins. And, and that speaks to me, speaks to me, of course, partly because being an immigrant, perpetual immigrant in several countries in the past few years. Uh, but also, I, I tend to read stories with my African lens on, and, and, and that generally makes me sort of identify more with, with, with a stranger. Uh, just a casual issue from from Africa, from just an African way of life. 
and, 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 and really looking at all these stories and how marginalized strangers, all people at the margins, seem to be meeting God and, and, how, and how the church, the Christian communities are responding to God's call in, in, in really moving out of their comfort zones to, to meet God at the margins. That spoke to me heaven. It's part of what struck me is that in, in many of these stories, um, you had local Christians on the ground um, trying to figure out. They hadn't. They don't. They didn't have. They don't have it figured out. They're trying to figure out how to join with God around those margins. And as I was listening to those stories again, uh, even earlier this morning. Uh, it was in the context of a, uh, a book that has become quite um, famous uh, very quickly here in North America called The Benedict Option, in which um, the argument overall is that we, we've got to become like Benedict uh, aside from and form something outside of uh, a culture that is growingly anti-Christian, that, that's part of the argument. And yet what struck me and challenges me when I listen, in listening to these stories is that actually the practices of Benedict run through all these stories, but they don't, they, what runs through these stories is not, is the society and the West and the culture terrible? Uh, and don't we have to, step apart from it but these are stories of people diving in and embracing and in the midst of that discovering god and i f i found that incredibly hopeful and encouraging and, and just add before others come in let, just let me anecdotally say to those who are listening in you are invited to participate in this conversation just uh, invite you to write and type in your comments or your question uh, in the chat area, and we'll get to that. But others on the panel, please. Yeah, can I just add a, a couple of words here? Um, I, I uh, did a couple of the interviews myself, and what struck me as I was doing the interviews was uh, is the fragility of um, the various experiments that were, that were taking place. And the fragility was actually quite important because it's actually what gave them the creative energy, if you like, to be able to say, well, actually, in the case of, for example, Calderdale, uh, they started doing a food bank. And as people came to faith, initially, they were placing them in existing churches. And it was only when that didn't work, because the kind of people they were seeing coming to faith just wouldn't fit in existing churches, that they thought, oh, we've got to start a church, which wasn't their intention actually it wasn't it was just something that happened along the way and so a lot of things that have transpired have been things that happened along the way they were never part of the original intention in fact i'm not sure that they even knew what the original intention was exactly and that's part of the um the risk uh, that's in, involved in all of these uh stories and i was i was just thinking this afternoon uh which uh, was very early morning you guys um, but um, uh, actually I was contrasting those with the stories that I used to come across in the 1980s, which were all about church growth. And actually, there's a massive shift because those stories of 30, 40 years ago were really all about, um, let's find some, some amazingly successful churches. We'll do a piece of analysis. And then once we've figured out what are the re reasons for the success, we can then replicate that everywhere. Well, um, actually, these stories are completely different than that. Um, first of all, they're not about massive success. They're about encountering God in unexpected places. And second of all, I defy you to replicate any of them. <laughs> they are amazingly unique situations. And, and that's, I think, part of the challenge of mission, isn't it, in the Western context, is we're not into formulas here. Uh, we're into uh, a very different kind of interaction with our neighborhoods, our communities, and indeed with what God is up to in those places.
Now, having said all that, um, and and uh, have, yeah, having said all that, I won't say it now, but I think there probably are some fairly Benedictine themes underneath all of that, which we might want to tease out a little bit later. But I'll I'll stop there at this point uh, and let others come in. I think um, yeah, and I th I th I think what was really exciting for me is that um, is is that the, the kind of logic, the internal logic of these stories was worked out en route, and that I, I want to kind of honour that as a way of doing theology, which we need to discover more and more of. In other words, there were no, in a sense, there were no presuppositions as to how God was going to work or how how church was going to look like or whether there was going to be connection with uh, church and so on and so forth. So I was struck particularly uh, with Linda's story about the Saturday gathering, that um, church language was, was, was received actually quite late on in the process. And it was received through practices, which you could connect with very ancient practices, but it, it was kind of deconstructing and then reinventing church from the inside out, which I think, I think is so exciting. And I think, speaking from the context of training uh, people for ministry something in me is challenged about um, the kind of mindset out of which these initiatives come which is not a traditional missional mindset as i see it i mean i'm picking up on what you said martin about back in the 1980s somehow these are all examples of of entering into the dangerous mission of God, which which does involve the church, but not actually probably in the ways that we anticipate or would like to think sometimes that God will be involved. And I think that that sense of what is it, riskiness, of edginess, of um, commitment, of real vulnerability is 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 a very wonderful thing to receive. And I, I found that in all of the stories, but it it kind of it kind of deconstructs a lot of our paradigms, doesn't it? And that's why it's so yeah, at one level quite. Um, threatening to those paradigms and and maybe the threat needs to be heard and received because uh, the stories that came out are stories from neighborhoods that I recognize in Britain and to an extent the whole secularization thing is part of that but actually probably some of these communities are never communities that the church has ever com uh, uh, connected with so I find incredible hope there and I, I suppose the challenge is to think how we yeah, how we encourage that kind of mindset, uh, which is a new kind of way of thinking, I think, for many. Paul, if I could come in again uh, on that note, I think these are also indicators of the church recovering its confidence, uh, which I do see increasingly in the UK. Um, yeah, we're de in a deeply secularized situation and the church has been intentionally marginalized, and all sorts of uncomfortable things have been happening. Uh, and yet, strangely enough, um, that very marginalization has freed us to be creative, actually, in a strange kind of way. And, um, you know, what have we got to lose? <laughs> not, not so much as we had to lose previously. And I don't know, I just, I just sense that um, increasingly, uh, we haven't got answers, and we haven't got a formula, and we haven't got, um, you know, seven-step programs, but we have got confidence. And that's, in some ways, in terms of the requirements of mission, that's probably the more important piece. We don't need the answers, but we do need some confidence to begin to, you know, do something, whatever that might be. Yeah, part of my... My, my journey in this has been really shaped by uh, reading Leslie Newbegin. I was just reading an, one of his essays this week with my students in Oxford, and uh, uh, the, the essays on the West Be Converted, I think one of his classic essays. And, and when I hear these stories, when I, when I see this life emerging, even at the margins, that gives me hope. It, it encourages me to answer yes to that question. Because I, I believe it's, of course, adding to Martin's suggestion about confidence, the humility with which these communities are engaging their neighbors. Uh, of course, not bringing the answers, just sometimes bringing friendship or creating space where people 
can come in and see as God, or as in the case of Nottingham, come in and pray. That, that humility that we, we don't have all the answers, we, but we, we're offering ourselves as, as avenues of God's love to the community, as avenues of God's response to life and the struggles in this community. That, that gives me hope, that encourages me to say, yes, actually the West can be converted. The, um, a couple of things, uh, some of the chats that are going on, uh, it'd be good for us to interact with. Um, we're talking about practices and uh, as, as lying underneath some of the things that we're aware of and noticing in these stories. And uh, Benedict has come up along with the Benedict Option book. Um, and one, one f- person, um, uh, Duke Vickerman, Duke Vipperman, uh, has mentioned that um, part of the, it's not intended, but part of the characteristic of the Benedictine option that people pick up is it, it tends to be closed. Uh, whereas um, if you take, for example, the, the Celtic monasticism, it's, it's porous. Uh, and there's a, there's a sense in which the, these stories are not closed but they're very much porous and it's in the porousness, if you will, that um, the God keeps turning up. I, I don't know whether that makes sense in terms of any of your reflections. Totally, Alan, I was having exactly the same response to that word porous on the screen. And um, I think it not just describes the intention, but some of the challenge. And um, particularly I was reading uh, through Linda's story in Halifax and it reminded me a lot of um, the idea of cities of refuge in the Old Testament. That there were certain communities that were set aside to be welcoming to those who kind of had a price on their head. And I was thinking about the challenge it must be to be the remainers in those communities where people are coming in with a great deal of need Uh, not expected to follow particular structures or maybe even stay for too long. Um, But I was kind of seeing the the Old Testament echoes of that, that there are people who are just called to build cities of refuge. And I wonder if that's a theme that brings quite a lot of these stories together. Mm, Yeah. Yeah, I never thought about that. That, Yes, yeah. The other thing we interested in comment that struck me, uh, and Harvey actually began to touch on this, is that very often I find anymore the Nürburgring question, can the West be converted, um, is an increasingly, certainly in North America, an anxious question. Uh, it's all going to hell on a handbasket. Uh, the churches have stepped on the banana peel. Uh, and the secular is overtaking. Um, and, and that tends to be the context in which Nibigan's question gets asked. And yet, in these stories, invite your comment, in, in these stories, um, it isn't the question, can the West be converted? It's God's up to so much in these places where we live that we can't keep up. And, 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 and that's a whole different stance and perspective, but I just invite comment on that. That's an interesting one, Al. Um, uh, I, I certainly think it's true that, that there is a huge amount happening. Uh, a lot of it under the radar. So So one of the issues becomes um how do we even know uh, what um what is going on actually uh, because it's a heck of a lot more than, than we realize um but i think the other piece about all of this and this is comes back to what jamie was saying on the screen there uh, and the other things that we've been talking about in terms of well what are some of these practices now one of the things i've sort of became aware of in conducting these stories is that there's a there's a big difference between 
a situation where we attempt to answer the question, what are, spiritual, what are people's spiritual needs and how do we meet them? Which is really a, a kind of individualistic consumer approach to uh, mission, as compared with how do we simply encounter people? But in the process, we are possibly unconsciously, and I, I'm glad to say, uh, necessarily inviting them into some kind of experience of community. Um, and, and that's a very countercultural stance. And now we might not even be aware that we're doing this, but actually we can't help but do it because the very missional God with which we're engaged, by the very nature of God, invites us into community. Um, now, I think some of the processes by which that happens, some may be uh, quite unconscious, actually, uh, but I think that's a very interesting process because I think it's a kind of um, unspoken and hidden part of many of the stories but it's actually quite an important part it's the creation of the invitation to experience community um, which is not a technique um, it, it's actually um, a consequence um, of um, a missionary posture if you like I'd invite others to step into that. <laughs> it was intriguing throughout these stories, and it's certainly our experience, that on one hand, like I say, we're, we're in kind of a rethinking, reflective mode, this land at our church. But in almost all of these stories, the, the kind of life-giving impulses didn't happen because Christians were sitting in a room even doing good critical reflection and lectio. It happened because some neighbor <laughs> showed up um, a, a, a cafe person said, hey, can you listen to the people here in the room? Or yeah. a traveling group showed up across the church yard. Or, I mean, it, it, the initiative seems to be outside um, the church, and the question is whether we're paying attention. And so there is a kind of formative stuff that's important on, on the church's role, right? Are you ready for awareness? Are you ready for extending yourself, can you clear time in your schedule to sit for 15 minutes and listen to a neighbor in a coffee shop, maybe longer? So, um, so where the initiative is coming from, which Al gets back to your point, that, that the Spirit of God is stirring and are we, do we have the practices, the sensibilities, um, the lives to be ready to um, notice, change our own lives, to, to engage. One of, one of the things it seems to me is that um, historically the church has sometimes not realized what, um, what's been happening until uh, quite some way down the line. We've been, we've been slow to catch on. And I wonder whether what we're seeing now in these stories from the margins is something that um, in a way the sooner the mainstream can see it, the better for all concerned. But my concern often is that, um, you know, in, in that mainstream place, there are so many, um, so many burdens which are historic and so much baggage which people take quite a long time to uh, move away from that they, that, that, that potentially people could be quite slow to see um, what is happening. And then sometime down the road will be saying, hey, how, how did we miss this? So I wonder if there are some ways in which, and this is maybe part of the role of the journal, to say, look in this place where uh, we're beginning to see all sorts of things that are very interesting taking place. Um, and let's, let's, you know, sort of go and explore there and leave behind some of our presuppositions and some of the programs and other things that we've been focusing energy on either building or maintaining and let's go and see what's growing over here in this place. I, I think that connects with uh, part of what Mark is saying. Uh, inside these stories, um, it's 
it's it's it's really very ordinary church people um, doing ordinary things in regular places that they discover God turning up. Um, and uh, you know, my experience is that Tim, you're right in terms of what a, very often a lot of established existing churches that there's fear, there's anxiety, there's the unknown. Uh, but what encourages me in these stories is the simplicity um, of the places and the ordinariness. Um, nobody's being asked to climb Mount Everest. <laughs> and yet in the ordinariness of what they do, um, what we're saying is it's amazing what they're up to. Um, and, and, and in my experience is that there's a whole host of people in our quote existing churches who are hungering for that. They're not resistant to it. They're hungering for it. And, and then maybe the, the question would be, how do we now discover and embed practices within our communities that would intentionally take us to what God is doing at the margins? Mm. We, we tend to centralize ourselves too quickly sometimes um, once 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 things begin to go well for some of our ministers we, we we tend to build a center and forget that we were at the margins just a few years ago and so how do we how do we embed practices in our identity in our DNA that that keeps us at the margins mm. or maybe keeps us engaged with the margins somewhere somewhere I don't know how best to put it, but yeah, that's, that's the issue that's coming to my mind. I think Martin will probably guess what I'm going to say, which is that many of us need to relocate to the margins. But I don't think this kind of knowledge comes um, outside of the context. Um, it could be we move to the margins within our own localities. You know, so the places where the church focuses its time and attention maybe needs to shift. Or even, dare I say, we need to have a drift back to the margins from the, the Christian church who is serious about what it means to live out the kingdom of God in, in their nation. A kind of reverse flow. And uh, I say that from knowing how completely under-resourced many of the most needy parts of, of my city are in terms of Christian um, just wit, just presence. So um, that's a huge ask, but I think that that is the kind of stance that it will take so that we're not quite so precious about our own um, little kingdoms and take more seriously the kingdom of God. Uh, I, I have lots of questions to ask and would love input around that whole margins conversation, but I, I don't want to, I want to be saying not jump in and see if, if others want to make comments at this point. Well, just a, <clears throat> a comment which has come, become quite a, an issue for us who are in established denominations. I think it is very, there's a, there's a sort of inbuilt centralism about my own denomination, um, and I'll name it, it's Anglicanism. Um, which which makes a lot of this talk feel even more edgy than it needs to be. Okay, so um, I've got a student at the moment who's working in a context where he wants to explore and has been really um, challenged to think in new ways about the, possibly the central metaphor in the Gospels for mission, which is that of hospitality. Mm -hmm. you know, what, what does that mean? What does that mean? And why can't the church do hospitality? And it just... It struck me again that the things that, um, particularly in my denomination, become the most precious things, let's name one of them, the Eucharist or communion, is itself a sign of the hospitality of God. <clears throat> and yet we have made that the kind of central place that you have to get through any number of courts to get to. Whereas in Jesus' ministry, it appears to be the most... <laughs> You know, that's where porousness happens, where Jesus welcomes people into the kingdom to experience something of the kingdom around the table. 
And so I, th I think that's part of what challenges uh, the very structures that many of us work in. Uh, and it, it's a kind of, it's, it is a deconstruction, but it's also a rediscovery, which I think is really exciting. I've, I felt reading through some of these stories, there's the Eucharist, there's that kind of hospitality working right at the forefront of what is going on here. Um, and, and the church needs to wake up to that and say, you know, what, do you, what do you really believe in when we talk about hospitality? Because this is about the hospitality of God, which the church may be actually being quite deaf to. I'm blind to, and we get terribly precious. I mean, I speak from my own denomination's point of view on this one. But that's, that's a question which I live with. And, it, you know, does it mean for me as an Anglican to have a very high view of the sacrament of the Eucharist means that it becomes much more out, outward looking than I thought it was. Whereas in practice, for us to have a very high view of the Eucharist means that it, it gets closed off from most people, if you get my drift. So I think it's a central tension here. And, uh, but it's, it's, I love the way that these stories are kind of poking away at some of those precious things uh, and causing us to rethink them. Let me uh, build on that a little bit. The, uh, and, and cut, just invite particularly uh, Harvey and Sally, the, the margin idea. Um, I, I wonder whether, uh, take the hospitality that for so many of us, and many of us listening in, um, margins can often sound like you've got to go and be with the poor, um, which is, um, is both true and a huge temptation to remain in power, um, if that makes sense. And I wonder whether there is a a profoundly simple practice around hospitality, which is the call of God no longer to primarily give hospitality, but wherever we are to be placing ourselves in places where we are needing to receive hospitality. And if that, if that were a practice that we began to press into, whether that practice would not begin to invite us more toward the margins. I, I'm asking, I'd be interested, Harvey and Sally, in your reflections on that. Sally, you wanna go first? Okay, well, it's um, not quite my, my stance because I am from the poor community that I've remained in. Right. Uh, but I, I get it, I get it, because too many people, um, have a kind of messiah complex about coming to the margins and that's the most unhelpful thing. I do think that um, we're on to something with hospitality and uh, for us in our journey it meant that we decided to always live uh, in an open house so we've always shared our home. It's been just a not a decision it's just been completely practical for us. We live with um, a, a housing crisis in our in our area and uh, I receive hospitality in the home I share mm -hmm. you know I haven't cooked a meal myself for months because we have a Brazilian family with us <laughs> and they feed us and uh, our church has no problem cooking for 50 or 60 of our neighbors because this Brazilian family know how to do it and I think the church are missing out when we buy into the golden calves of a very private life um, a very secure um, capitalist ideal of owning your own space. I think this will be incredibly challenging for most to hear, but I would like to start or continue the campaign which says no man should have an empty bedroom. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> two things. One, um, I, I, th I think hospitality is to be based in really being with, being with the poor, being with the need. It doesn't necessarily mean moving in to live with at all times. Of course, some people will be caught to that and, and it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. But in, in, in forming sustaining relationships with 
people at the margins and being able to not engage with them as, as, as if we were going there to solve all their problems, but really to, to borrow their eyes and, and, and be able to see the world from, from their experience. Uh, and, and, and that being on a journey with them, it's not, not just a one-time thing, but journeying with them so that you, you get to understand more what's, what's really happening here. Now, uh, I think one of the most revealing times for me when I was in the US was working with Craig Van Gelder, who pointed me to, is it Gibson Winter's book, The Suburban Captivity of the Church? Yeah, 1960s. That's right. And, and, and how uh, being located in the, in the suburbs, most of the churches lost touch with life happening downtown. I, I, I led a vineyard church in St. Paul, Minnesota. And, and it, it was quite clear that some of my, my friends serving churches around the city did not really understand the issues that we were dealing with in the city. Now, we, we, we can say, we, we can talk about, about life among the poor and we can speak about it anecdotally. It is up until you, you have been with them. It's up until you have, you have journeyed with them. You have been able to see life, to, to understand some of the things that are going through them, that, that really hospitality becomes possible. Otherwise, we, we, we're talking from a distance. We, and, and, and really, that's, that's one of the struggles that I've had with, with, with uh, dealing with this conversation in a Western context. Because as Christianity has moved south, has moved, as, 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 as Africa has become increasingly a Christian, there has been a shift that now a majority of African Christians are semi-retreat, maybe non-educated uh, and poor. And, and so how do we live in mission, in connection with, with these lives when we begin to talk about the Western context? Others, other comments at this point? Well, I notice we're getting into difficult water around uh, the question of what is what the mar what are the margins? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is fascinating. Some fascinating discussions uh, from uh, others uh, in the the text messages. Um, and I think I think the margins are quite interesting actually. Uh, and I think it's more a question of not where the margins are so much as um, the margins or the marginalised or the, let's just say the needy, uh, break in on us in all sorts of interesting ways and interesting places. Um, so what coming back to is, uh, that tends to happen where our posture is one of um, hospitality and generosity and listening primarily. Uh, these are the postures that tend to cause us to have the margin break in on us. Um, and that can happen uh, in, you know, we're in quite a prosperous, leafy area, uh, Bourneville, it's, it's very nice. Uh, but actually it's amazing how many people are um, in tremendous need and heartache and that can be uh, people who are ostensibly quite wealthy, but actually for a whole variety of reasons, are in immense need and anguish. So I think there's a complexity around all of this, um, which you know makes me want to say let's let's not worry about too much about what we mean by the margins, so much as let's think about the postures that we might be taking, which cause us mm -hmm. to begin to encounter what God is up to in our neighborhood. Yeah, one of those postures, I wonder, Martin, if you take the uh, Vancouver story, uh, mm. Grandview Calvary, it struck me that um, what was clear there was uh, Tim, the 25 years. Yeah. Um, that's a posture. Indeed, uh, 
and um, the capacity to tell stories in that particular video, which I did, was those stories were not coming out of analysis and data. They were coming out of 25 years. Mm. And that, that, that to me is a, a, a critical practice or posture. I suppose what Benedict called stability. Um, yeah. I don't know what the Celts call it, but th th that's one such posture, I think. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think the, the business of remaining of taking place seriously uh, over a long period of time is indeed what opens up um, so much creativity. And even, even with the stories that we've got, which apparently uh, are things that have happened recently, they actually, although it's true that they have happened recently, they've actually come out of some pretty extensive journeys that people have been on. So, They've stumbled upon this, these expressions of mission after years and years of grappling with some of the issues of mission. So I think you're right. I think stability, remaining, longevity, commitment, faithfulness, all of these things are part of the postures that uh, um, allow us to begin to see what God has all the time been up to, but maybe we just have not been alert to it. Yeah, and that's another posture, isn't it? It's, um, and I'm asking, no testing, but it, I see so much of the posture of fear and anxiety. Um, and, and I see that particularly in North America amongst clergy, where the basic fear and anxiety is loss of paycheck, <laughs> to, to be blunt and very honest. Um, and, and that's absent in the stories that we will that we've been looking at. Um, it's 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 a it's just this not fear and anxiety, but this sense of in just the very ordinariness of where people are, they stumble upon God at work. Um, and I'm not sure you can stumble upon if you're driven by fear and anxiety. So, what are the did you notice these people didn't have a paycheck? I the, did. I the, did. <laughs> the people starting these um, these works on the margin were not the professional leaders, not the, the you know, and, and we gave up our stipend a while ago and we would, uh, we, we now have a part-time one and I would never choose anything other than that because that's part of the problem, isn't it? Is that if you're looking for an institution to kind of uh, validate you, you're, you're, you're going to be so closed in your thinking about what God would like you to do. Well, that would tumble no, us. No empty, bed, no empty bedrooms in Mances, only part-time stipends. Who votes yes for that? There are two. Two, two postures, right? No empty bedrooms, no full-time salaries. You, you dropped off. That, that, that's, I think we just need to be practical about it. That, that is what we need to be thinking about in training leaders, is bivocational le uh, leadership styles is freeing. And it, uh, it means that the resources in the church can be used to provide more part-time stipends for other people or to do some real investment in the structures in their communities that cost money. I, mean, I would add to that. I would add to that, Sally, in terms of also if people are doing something in the community that gives them a sort of a role which is not, I'm the person wearing a dog collar, I'm the professional, uh, clergy person but you know actually I'm involved in um, you know in, in running a, a, a small business in this in this community that's a real source of blessing in a number of ways and it's something that um, enables co a different kind of conversation to happen than happens if actually you identify the, the professionals in the community where you need a rite of passage performed or you need to in some way um, you know you're, you're sort of 
you, you know, you have a sort of identifiable religious problem and that's who you're supposed to go to. And I think that some of the ways in which that bivocationalism can express itself is going to open up whole new areas of ministry that at this moment in time most people cannot begin to imagine. I think it's a huge challenge for those of us involved in, um, in training and, and preparing and the formation of people who are going into a ministry that they've always seen as a full-time thing, they've always seen themselves being set apart, ordained in order to be uh, not doing something uh, bivocational, but, but fully focused on um, some kind of professional um, uh, role which is paid um, in such a way that enables you to uh, focus your full-time energies on it. So I do think, I mean, I do entirely agree with you, Sally, um, but I think that uh, those of us who are doing something bivocational and doing ministry as something that is not our full-time role, um, but we are in full-time ministry, it's just not full-time paid ministry, I think are very, very much, we are on the margins of that conversation as well. And maybe an addition to that would be simply thinking about the priesthood of all believers that um, our Christian neighbors and friends in our communities are, are in the ministry, even though they are not they are not, in some cases, ordained or recognized by the church. But as we have seen in these stories, that God is, is moving wherever those people are. And, and maybe as, as church leaders, we would recognize and maybe encourage that, that, you know, sometimes you don't, you don't need all these institutional things to, to be effective in the ministry. So we're, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we've got about five minutes. Um, I want to respect the time and um, just those who have been listening in, there's been a lot of, um, uh, a lot of communication going on through the chat. Uh, are there any other particular questions that you'd like to ask at this moment? We, again, this is a coming to a table together where those of us, that you can see on the screen, we're experimenting here. We're we're learning that how do we how do we listen and let the spirit of God tug us and grab us through these stories and what you'll have seen uh, across all of us. I'll raise my mea culpa hand. Is that it's not always easy uh, to remain in the story. Sometimes we've We've got on a plane and gone to 40,000 feet, but um, these stories have been very rich. Um, the, um, it strikes me that even in the stories, we have both people who are inside, quote, institutions and people around the edges that are people who are full-time and people who are not. And, and it's almost as if it's in the matrix and the spaces uh, and the porousness of that, that God keeps turning up. Um, one person asks, uh, invites some quick responses. Uh, how do we discern the stories that are worth dwelling in? Uh, great question. Uh, anybody want to very quickly uh, respond to that? How do we do this? Let me, let me comment on that one and, that, and connect it with the earlier one um, uh, from Jamie. So um, Chris's question about discerning stories and Jamie's about how do we, it was along the line of commitment, what kind of commitment do we need? And since, since at least um, some of the folks around our tables at our church aren't going to quite go with Sally yet on the no empty bedrooms, although I'm not remembering any empty bedrooms right now, come to think of it. Um, but we're definitely there on no full-time staff and those kind of things. Yeah. But what practices, so, so in fact, one of the practices uh, for Chris, I think is we just need to keep telling stories and talking about those stories. And that really becomes a practice, doesn't it? Do you see God in that story? Do you see, do you see love? Do you see justice? Do you see beauty? Do you see, um, uh, human, do you see humility? Do you, I mean, whatever 
kind of um, observations we can make. And so at least even among any, any human in the room, those kind of commitments of storytelling and listening to stories and discussing stories and connecting stories with scripture. I mean, there's some very basic things that don't take a lot of training and a lot of time and well, they can take time, but it's a wonderful way to spend time. Um, but uh, it was interesting how many of the stories in the journal were about listening to somebody else's story. Um, and it's a human contact with, because otherwise, how do you, since God shows up in real lives, that means it's accessible in the stories of those lives. So I'm wondering about just the basic, those kind of basic commitments of a group of people to tell each other stories, to listen to each other's stories. Seems to me to be the place that, I don't know whether we're commitment, loyalty, caring, all get developed and how we spot the spirit of God. Anyone else? As we speak, the local church is getting for a food and ale festival, <laughs> which is going to be going on. There will be probably thousands of people across the doorstep um, tomorrow. And, uh, you know, I'll be looking for stories in, in the midst of that interaction. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen, but it will be very interesting. <laughs> well, I'm going to, uh, with great appreciation, uh, thank all of you, both the panelists and those of you who have uh, been present and interacted on the chat. Uh, for us, this is a beginning, um, an attempt to say, how do we listen together? How do we virtually gather around a table, invite conversation, and test how are we hearing God? So we thank you. And uh, our hope is that there will be more of these. And our prayer is that in the places where you are, you might find those porous spaces where the spirit is bubbling. So God be with you and thank you everyone. Take care.